Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, we've still got a few people coming in, but we're going to get started just to, to keep the ball rolling. Uh, I'd like to introduce our two speakers first. Um, we have with us Colonel William Dollar Young Jr., who is an award-winning strategist and leader with nearly 29 years in the United States Air Force and 2,400 flying hours in a variety of aircraft. Colonel Young possesses four master's degrees and a PhD in engineering, uh, engineering systems from MIT, where he created System Theoretic Process Analysis for Security, uh, which is now used internationally by organizations in a variety of industries to perform security analysis, supporting secure system engineering. Uh, we also have with us uh, Captain Matthew Oust, who is a US Air Force Academy and AFIT graduate in computer science. Captain Oust currently works as the lead cybersecurity analyst for 10 acquisition programs at the Afrotech Detachment 2. Uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Colonel William Young uh, to kick us off and take us through. And just to let everyone know how this is going to work format wise, um, Colonel Young and uh, Captain Oust are going to give comments uh, and give a presentation for about the first uh, 10 minutes or so. As you have questions and when you have questions, please enter them into the group chat. Uh, I will be going through and capturing and harvesting those questions so we can do some kind of structured Q&A uh, with our hosts uh, towards the end of the session. We'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So with that, uh, Captain uh, Colonel Young, uh, over to you. And All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad you all could join us. Uh, first of all, the most important thing, we are not going to talk about cyber resilience. So for those of you that uh, may never have uh, thought about those terms and you're here and uh, you work with traditional engineering and you're familiar, especially with aircraft, with things like airworthiness, uh, that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, but more specifically, we're going to talk about the uh, airworthiness for security process and how do you actually uh, achieve uh, that process and we're going to be applying a methodology that fortunately uh, is not just an Air Force uh, one-off thing it's actually something that's listed in the uh, civilian standards for airworthiness security uh, methods and considerations and it's called system theoretic process analysis for security so uh, big picture wise uh, again, I've got the definition there of what airworthiness for security means. Uh, but what I want to really focus on is as we think about and we go back to all the discussions from the great speakers of the last few days, uh, as we think about what does it take to actually bring a flying car uh, and then uh, put it into someday uh, some of the mobility missions that uh, were uh, mentioned by the keynotes. Uh, things like mobility, um, medevac, um, search and rescue, uh, you still at the end of the day have to be able to uh, make sure the thing takes off and uh, lands. Uh, and so that's really what we're talking about here is making sure that those key functions necessary to accomplish the mission are preserved uh, in the face of a deliberate adversary attack. And the way we're going to think about that is that rather than try and go out and pen test your prototype uh, or look through all the gazentas and gazaltas and figure out how it could get pwned. Uh, yeah, in theory, we could do that, uh, but realistically, uh, the amount of value that it would provide you all uh, and us is probably not all that great, especially early on. That's not to say that we won't do uh, detailed testing later on, but rather what we'd really like to do is, is bite off an initial chunk. And what we wanna do is start with the things or the functionality uh, that's most important to the mission. And when I say functionality for those that, that aren't that familiar, just think of that as the features. So for example, uh, one of the key pieces of functionality uh, is gonna be propulsion. Now, how that propulsion is provided, be it one engine, two engine, uh, that, that doesn't really matter. There's certain high level uh, characteristics of propulsion that we can assess early on and figure out uh, how, um, what the impact of any sort of errant orders are gonna be uh, on that system. 
Uh, and really we're looking there is how much misbehavior uh, can we expect? But more importantly is what's gonna, once we identify that small subset of key mission critical features, uh, what we really wanna look at is, is how capable is the architecture that you've developed for keeping those uh, systems under control in the face of bad commands. And uh, for some of you, this is probably a new way of thinking about security in general, but really at the end of the day, security is about preventing losses. Now, uh, traditionally some of those losses, when they refer to human life, we, we tend to uh, think of that as safety. But realistically, uh, in this case, we're just gonna think about mission losses and we're gonna consider those a security function and when we look at the mission losses, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look, look, that, look at that uh, in terms of the airworthiness. And probably one of the most important things is that this approach allows us to treat airworthiness um, as any other engineering trade. So we're talking about how far does it need to fly, how fast does it need to fly. Uh, the, the key benefit of this approach is that it actually enables us to now be able to define rather unambiguously uh, how protected does it need to be? And uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, all of your work done here, uh, because it's uh, supported by DO356 Alpha, uh, will actually support uh, your eventual airworthiness security certification. So it's not like you're doing, again, doing something off on the side that you can't uh, apply to the, to the homework that you're already gonna have to do. Uh, so, want to talk just a little bit about functionality. So if I, if I showed you a picture of the uh, pipe on the screen and I asked you, is, is it adequately protected or is it secure? Well, first question would be is secure for what? Uh, so if it's going in my toilet, uh, we're doing a renovation right now, uh, probably good enough. However, uh, if it's going in a uh, Minuteman missile, uh, it may not be. And so it's the same, same pipe, but depending on uses, uh, that determines uh, how secure is secure enough. Likewise, if we were to take the notion of airworthiness and apply it to a car, uh, we might have that fancy golf cart there uh, and then ask ourselves, well, is it landworthy or how landworthy is it? Uh, well, it would depend, right? It, if I'm gonna use it on the Eglin Air Force Base golf course, it's probably good enough. However, if my intention is to use it uh, in a uh, highly contested urban environment, probably not so much. And so really what I want us to do is think about airworthiness really through the lens of fitness for a particular purpose. And in our case, that particular purpose is gonna de be, is defined by the particular mission that we intend to apply it to. So uh, there's kind of three lenses that we could think of as we start to assess protection. Uh, the first one is uh, the one that most folks are familiar, most familiar with, uh, and that being threat analysis, where we would look at all the particular threats uh, to our architecture and our mission. And then uh, we would look at our architecture through vulnerability analysis. And what we would be most concerned about is what are those portions in our architecture where a threat has the capability to reach out and cause some sort of impact. But what I like to tell people is that that really is only part of the picture. And in fact, it leaves out the most important part. Uh, despite, despite the fact that nearly most of the cybersecurity uh, analysis efforts today focus there, what we're really concerned about is the mission impact. So for example, if despite an attack, uh, a successful attack against our architecture through a vulnerability, if an adversary is unable to disrupt the mission, then we may care, but the degree of effort that we're gonna spend on trying to fix it may not be as great and probably won't be as great as uh, something that uh, produces a catastrophic uh, kill to the mission. Or basically, if a threat gets into the architecture, then they have the ability to completely disrupt the mission. Unfortunately, what we tend to do is we start at the threat a lot of times and work our way up through the architecture analysis and then finally get to the mission. The problem though is that you see over in this region right here, you have a lot of cases where threats can get in and impact the architecture, but it doesn't really have a significant impact on our mission. Rather, what we're going to do 
is we're actually going to do this top down. So we're going to take the mission sets that have been proposed uh, by uh, over the last couple of days, and we're going to look at those and do a functional mission analysis. From that, we're going to identify a minimum set of essential functions. Think of those as the absolute key features that are required to accomplish the mission. And then we're going to look at the architecture for the prototypes that are already built, and then just ask ourselves, hey, how well is the architecture as designed capable of protecting those minimum set of uh, functions? And so again, we're gonna assess the ability to protect the functions that are most important to the mission. It's not to say that we're not gonna concern ourselves with the architecture or threats eventually, but rather the initial portion is gonna be all about figuring out this overlap and then down the road when we go into more detailed testing, then we'll begin to bring the threats uh, more into view. So let's then turn our attention to what the process is gonna look like. So the first thing we're gonna do is frame the protection problem. Rather than just saying, uh, protect the system or protect, uh, secure the system, okay, that's awesome, but uh, from an engineering perspective, that's very, very difficult to do. Protect it against what, for how long, uh, all those things are really, really important. And what we also want to do is avoid presupposing that there's a particular check is secure. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look and develop a conceptual architecture and a related set of high-level products that cover that overlap between the mission and the architecture. The goal there is really to begin to understand uh, how, those, how those features are actually mapped out. And then we'll go into a uh, process of mapping the actual mission conceptual architecture down to the prototype physical architecture. So you can think of that as bridging the gap between uh, what we need and what we have. And from there, then we'll begin the assessment itself. Uh, think of this as uh, a set of high-level war games where you've got both a blue team and a red team. But unlike some of the uh, war games that folks may be more familiar with, uh, this is very, very focused, again, on that small set of features that are absolutely critical. So we're asking ourselves uh, what protections are in place against specific scenarios and then how effective are those protections? And the protections need not be purely technical. Uh, they can also be organizational uh, in your processes, but they can also be managerial in terms of your leadership and uh, continuous monitoring of what's there. After the assessment, again, this is one of the, the I think gonna be one of the real strong points of this approach is that we're actually able to sit down with you and provide you feedback. Uh, uh, this is, this is uh, feedback that can go directly towards uh, your aircraft, uh, I'm sorry, your airworthiness certification. Uh, it also can feed into your assurance cases. It also can feed into um, your more detailed cyber testing down the road. So this is one of the great uh, things about this approach also is that it gives us the opportunity to continuously reuse our products. So by focusing on a very, very specific uh, security problem and framing that out, it gives us the capability to continue to expand our knowledge, but also as our architecture gets more detailed, as we make design decisions and rationale decisions, we can point back to that analysis to say why we chose A or B. And then that really gets us into the last step, and that is really to iterate and improve the, uh, the prototype. So let me pause there, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to, uh, to Pumba to, to kind of give you an operator's perspective uh, as uh, the team lead along with uh, uh, Jen Kreider. Thanks, Carolyn Young. Uh, so I'll keep this quick, that way we can have plenty of time for questions. Uh, but really, the, what I want to emphasize is as we go through this process together, uh, what we're really trying to do is uh, learn as a team. So the, the testers part of, that are part of Agility Prime, we're going to be working side by side with you 
in order to learn about your program or your system and then have you help teach us ways that we can use your system in a military application. Um, but really the, the big difference that I think you'll see working with us uh, is that we're not going to be focused on pen testing. Um, that is a very small part of trying to build a system that is survivable, that is airworthy. Uh, so really we're going to be focusing on the engineering with you. And like Colonel Young said, uh, the process we use is part of DO 356 Alpha. Uh, so this is a international standard that we'll be doing with you. And everything that, that we do, all of the results that we produce, all the recommendations are yours to keep. So if you continue with Agility Prime and we, we find a use for your, your flying orb and we can actually put it in the field, great. If not, well, you have something really awesome that you can take back with you and bake that into your, your platform and use for years to come. I think that's everything I have. Um, so I'm good if we want to open it up to questions. Yeah, thanks to you both. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. First question is from James Poss, uh, saying this is a great approach to cybersecurity, but how confident are you that you can convey these requirements to our acquisition personnel so they can use them as a guide? Yeah, that's actually a, a great question. And um, one of the things that I don't know how many of you got to hear um, uh, Jason Bartolome speak uh, previously, um, but he is uh, the, one of the program leads for GBSD, and they're actually using this methodology, STPA SEC, uh, to support the security, safety, and nuclear surety uh, analysis of the, uh, the GBSD. And so, so far it is working exceptionally well. There's been a few hiccups. Uh, I would say probably the biggest challenge has just been helping people get up to, up to speed on the approach. Um, but in terms of being able, because we're focused not on uh, specific, uh, the specific uh, how, but rather we're focused on the what, then it ideally fits uh, into what it is a requirement is supposed to be. In fact, when we talk, what we're really doing is we're building functional requirements versus physical requirements. And so we use those functional requirements to then inform and guide and provide traceability to the physical uh, uh, requirements for the system. Something I want to add on to is the, when you look at the cyber requirements that a lot of programs are using, most of them are bland and generalized of use NIST standard such and such. Use the cybersecurity attributes from the Joint Chiefs of Staff publication. That is very open-ended and leaves a lot of room for interpretation. What we're looking to do is not just say build cyber secure stuff, but to really get after that functional aspect of build or ensure that your functions operate in only the manner you want them to, when you want them to, and in no other way. That eliminates all of the vulnerabilities that could spawn off. So now we're not even trying to find those because they can't be there. We have functionally designed them out and we never had to find them to begin with. Excellent. We have about uh, 45 seconds left, but last question here uh, from Andy Thurling. Uh, is your process robust to changes in mission and mission creep? Yeah, I, I think um, it's actually, it, it's again, another great question. And the robustness comes to the fact that uh, if you look at our missions in general, um, what changes more often is the technology. So let's use a specific example. If, if we were to uh, bring back some of the World War, World War I fighter pilots and expose them to some of what our fifth, the tactics of our fifth gen pilots, uh, just basic, uh, basic fighter maneuvers, they would absolutely recognize them. So the mission of air superiority uh, has remained remarkably consistent over time. Now, what has changed is the technology and what the technology has been able to, uh, enabled us to do. So it's the uh, same tactics farther, uh, faster. However, the, the same approach, the same principles uh, tend to be very, very stable and enduring. Excellent. Uh, with that, I have to apologize for uh, any other burning questions that people had. Uh, we want to make sure that you make your next sessions on time. 
so for all of the participants, thank you for joining us. Uh, to Colonel Young and Captain Aus, thank you very much uh, for this presentation. I'd invite everyone now, if you leave this meeting, uh, go back to the Agility Prime website where you will find the link uh, for the next uh, topic that you'd like to join. So follow the link, join the next meeting, and they are starting now. So thanks everyone, and we'll see you in the next meeting. Right, for those that are just joining, we will just wait about one more minute for people to transition from their last uh, breakout and we will get started promptly. Right, so I think we will get started. I think we have a critical mass here. Uh, so I want to thank you all for joining us in uh, round two of these breakouts. Uh, I am joined here today with uh, Colonel William Dollar Young Jr., who is an award-winning strategist and leader with nearly 29 years in the United States Air Force and 2,400 flying hours in a variety of aircraft. Colonel Young possesses four master's degrees and a PhD in engineering systems from MIT, where he created system theoretic process analysis for security, which is now used internationally by organizations in a variety of industries to perform security analysis. We are also joined by Captain Matthew Oust, who is a US Air Force Academy and AFIT graduate in computer science. Captain Oust currently works as the lead cybersecurity analyst for 10 acquisition programs at the Afotech Detachment 2. Um, I'm sure you all kind of got the, the gist of how it's going in the last round, but just to reiterate here, uh, we are going to go for uh, just over 10 minutes um, with Colonel Young and, and Captain Oust giving a presentation. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to add them in the chat and we'll be posing those to our speakers uh, following the presentation. So just put those in the chat and I'll kind of harvest those as we go. So with that, uh, Colonel Young, I turn it over to you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, it is really a, uh, an honor and a privilege to, to, uh, to be a part of such a really, really uh, neat event. Um, I think that probably the, the most important thing for you to take away is that we're not gonna talk about cyber resilience. Uh, again, unless you're familiar with the Department of Defense, that may be something that uh, you're not familiar with, but, but if any of you do any work with any sort of aircraft, uh, then, then you're definitely familiar with airworthiness. And so what we're gonna talk about today is really uh, the airworthiness uh, security. And I put the uh, definition up there from DO 356 Alpha, one of the international standards on that. But what I want you to take away is that really, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on the mission. Uh, you've heard those for, uh, in terms of potential uses for this uh, technology over the last three days. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to use that to uh, identify a set of critical features that are necessary to accomplish the mission. We're not going to worry about initially about how they're implemented on your architecture. That'll come later. But really, we're going to begin with the functional analysis of the mission to figure out, hey, what features are required and most important to accomplish the mission? And then once we have that, then we're going to uh, look at your particular architectures to really try to assess how well do you protect those features. So things like, okay, what's the impact of uh, if, if an errant order is given uh, by an adversary or attacker gets on your system, how much, bis how much uh, trouble can they cause? You know, what's the degree of misbehavior they can induce? And then more importantly, what do you have built in to your particular system, your particular prototype, for making sure that that doesn't happen and keeping the system under control in the face of those bad commands. We know that no system is impregnable. Uh, so how do you handle it uh, when an adversary is able to get in? And, and what helps us uh, to do this is that, again, we're gonna focus on the things that are most important to the mission. And uh, by doing this and keeping it functionally and focused on the mission, then really, we're going to be able to raise the level of airworthiness into the engineering trades, things like how far does it need to go, how fast, uh, those level uh, big picture things that are, and considerations that typically uh, security is an add-on and left to the very end. And so through this approach, we're going to be able to bring that forward. So. <clears throat> If I were to show you, to, to give you a little bit of more uh, detail on what I mean by that, if I were to show you this pipe and ask, is it, adequate, is it adequately protected? Well, the answer is it depends. Uh, is it going in the toilet that in our new house that we're remodeling? Or is it going in uh, uh, the ICBM replacement that uh, Colonel Bartolome is, uh, and his team are designing? Again, unless you know the particular use of the of the device or the, the architecture or the system. It's very, very difficult to make that assessment. Likewise, if I were to show you that, that really cool golf cart there and ask you, and if such a term as landworthiness as the equivalent of airworthiness existed and say, hey, how landworthy is it? Well, if, if we're gonna put it on the uh, Eglin golf course, hey, it's probably good enough. However, if the intent is to use that that really cool golf cart to move people around in a heavily contested urban uh, combat environment, probably not so good. So it's not that in the case of the pipe or the vehicle that something is inherently wrong with them. Uh, they're both very, very good for particular purposes. The question is, what's that purpose? And so likewise, we want to think of airworthiness and our airworthiness security assessment is trying to understand how worthy is the product, how What's the fit between uh, your pro particular prototype and the environment that we are planning it to potentially use it in, uh, that being the, the set of hypothetical missions? So to, to delve a little bit deeper into this idea of protections, really there's, there's three lenses that we could use. Uh, the first is the threat analysis, which uh, most people tend to start with, and that's just saying, hey, what are the potential threats to the vehicles? Uh, and then we can begin to do a vulnerability analysis looking at the architecture concerning ourselves with the region where the, a threat can exploit a vulnerability in the architecture. However, even though most this is typically the focus for most uh, cybersecurity analysis, it's really a bottom-up process because what's left out of this is the mission. And if we just look here at the overlap between threats and architecture, we notice that there's a lot of area that threats can get to, but really aren't mission critical. And so what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna reverse this and go top down by focusing initially from the mission, deriving a minimum set of features that really identify, hey, what are those things that are most critical to accomplish the various missions? And once we get that small subset, we're gonna focus there and then eventually in subsequent uh, more detailed tests, we've done more development and gotten more insight uh, on the particular threats. Then we can try to narrow ourselves to no kidding this region right here where it has mission impact as an architectural vulnerability and threats can get to it. But one of the benefits of the approach that we're gonna use going top down is that 
any of this area right here is potentially reachable by a threat. So assessing it in totality gives us a much richer insight into where we need to spend our resources to improve the uh, architecture to accomplish the mission. So again, it's about identifying the functions will come from the mission and then looking at the architecture to figure out how good are we at protecting uh, those features. So let's look at the process. The first step is we're gonna actually frame the protection problem. Uh, this is a lot, uh, this one step uh, in practice has been one of the most important things I've seen because it goes from uh, the poor engineer being told, okay, secure the system. Sir, ma'am, uh, what, does, what does that mean? And what do you mean? Secure against what, for how long, to what purpose? Those are all really, really important considerations that when you provide that for the engineer, actually make everything you do better because you can be more specific. It also gives you the capability to make sure that all your engineering efforts are, are addressing what the stakeholders and end user really care most about. The next thing we're gonna do is develop a conceptual architecture just based on the functionality and a related set of products that then we can now provide uh, each of the uh, organizations that are bringing prototypes to kind of say, hey, look, this is a breakdown of the mission and the most critical functionality. We've done that. And now what we need your help with is in step three, we need to map the functional architecture to your specific uh, physical architecture. So we know that uh, the features are required for the mission. We just want to see where you've, how you've put them, how you've allocated that functionality, and, and then really assess how well you can control it. So think of this as uh, high level war games, uh, very, very, not general pen testing, but rather um, identifying the critical features, looking at how, how it's implemented on your architecture, and then looking at the controls that you have probably already put to do something about, uh, to, to, uh, to handle those, and then asking ourselves how effective are they. The great thing about that is that now we can provide you feedback on the effectiveness of your controls against this very, very specific set. It's not to say that we're gonna to try to cover every uh, eventuality or every scenario, but rather we're gonna focus on the particular scenarios and the features that are most critical to mission accomplishment. And then based upon what we learned, then uh, as uh, uh, Pumba brought up, uh, all of this is yours. So you can take it and you can continue to iterate and improve the prototype. Uh, so again, it does produce several artifacts, then those artifacts are yours. So let me pause there and turn it over to Pumba. Thanks, Charlie Young. Uh, don't have a whole lot to add. Uh, this really summarizes what we're looking to accomplish uh, for anyone who works with Agility Prime uh, and the, the test team in general. Um, I think the only thing uh, I would highlight is as we go through this process, we're really looking at not just what an adversary could do to a system, uh, but rather we're looking at the system holistically and what faults may or may not be there. And then working with you to try to engineer those out. That way, there is no, there is no fault that an adversary could exploit to cause an effect. So that's really the, the bottom line of what we're getting after is better engineering rather than better pen testing. And I'll open up questions. All right, thanks to you both. Uh, the first question that we had come in here uh, from Brandon Russell is, how extensive of a role would the DOD or TSA take in the regulation of software being used for automated EV tolls? Oh boy, uh, how will they? play or how big of a role should they play? Because I think they're two different questions. And um, uh, obviously, uh, I, I think that uh, the role they will play uh, will be determined over time. But I think we have a really interesting opportunity um, because I, I think if we can provide more assurance that we've thought through uh, all of the eventualities and we're able to provide proof that hey if this if this happens here's what we're going to do about it so that's that's why the role of scenarios are particularly important and that's also where this analysis the artifact that we produce through the early analysis becomes really really important 
because you can then come back and show here's what we thought through. And so if the more assurance you're able to provide, I think it opens the opportunity for less uh, uh, direct oversight, but more general oversight. Um, Pumba? I'll leave it there. I think, you, I think you captured it well. I do want to jump on this, uh, this question from yeah. Bell Chat Sparks, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, Let's read it out. This is what is the biggest cybersecurity risk or gap that we need to focus shoring up to maintain vehicle airworthiness and operational airworthiness, security at the compute edge and IoT, and the integrated vehicle system, command and control infra infrastructure. Easy peasy. Yeah. So this is this is really the beauty of uh, the method in which we we conduct uh, cyber assessments is. Typically, we don't start by looking at any of those individual components because at the end of the day, humans are still generating these systems. They're still writing the code. They're still designing the hardware. There will always be faults. What we look to accomplish by really getting to the weeds of the engineering is, can we design a system so it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter if this component is compromised or that component is compromised. We build in enough disaggregation and redundancy and fault tolerance into the system that you can still complete your mission. Maybe not perfectly, maybe you can't do everything, but we design a system in such a way that if a, if a hacker gets into one component, all right, well, we have a quadruple redundant system made by four different manufacturers that use four different code bases and four different architectures. Good luck getting into all four at the same time and then trying to affect them all in the exact same way because they're also Byzantine failure tolerant which means that they all have to, or the majority have to agree on a decision before it's made. That's what we're looking to accomplish. And, and I'll take it even a step further. I love the question. The number one thing that you can do, uh, probably without a doubt, is get rid of unnecessary functionality and features. Do that. If you did nothing else, you would massively improve not only the security of the system, but you would also decrease the complexity and you would increase the safety. But that runs into the tension because a lot of the things that we use to sell are those features. So that's why being able to come in and have a, uh, multiple stakeholders at the table and decide literally for each go feature by feature and use a risk reward. So we can use this methodology to generate insight into the mission risk associated with a particular feature. And then you have the ability to ask the stakeholder, hey, is it really that valuable to you? So uh, this has actually been done successfully on, uh, this, on uh, GBSD with some of their features where we were actually able to get them to remove features, remove complexity that were nice to have, but the attack surface that they would have generated would have been very, very difficult to uh, assure. So again, that is the one thing, if you do nothing else, get rid of features that are absolutely mission critical. And in order to do that, you actually have to do the analysis to determine what is mission critical. And we've, from a operational test perspective, we've had similar successes with systems that they already have a prototype and they're already building it, being able to come in and work with them and help them realize they don't need these features and design them out before the final version is completed. So we can do that even with a prototype as well. Excellent. So our next question is, how standardized are the countermeasures likely to be by legal mandate? For example, go to X place if winds are over Y. Uh, can, can you say that, say, that, say that again, Aaron, please? So how standardized are the countermeasures likely going to be by legal mandate, and the example given was go to X place if winds are over Y. Yeah, I, I think um, what we'd really like to do, and, and Puma brought this up earlier, what we'd really like to do is free up engineers to be engineers. So rather than tell you how to do something, we'd really tell, rather tell you why and what, and then and you let engineers use their creative freedom uh, to figure out the best how to satisfy the, uh, the what. So I think, again, if we can make the case that we've thought through this and, the, and be able to show our, show our homework, um, I think that increases our ability to earn the trust of the very senior stakeholders to allow us 
uh, to exercise more freedom and fight against uh, being told very specifically, go here and use this countermeasure. We had a, a great question that we did not get the chance to answer last time, which is that, uh, and this is from Major Ron Hogan, um, cybersecurity reveals system vulnerabilities. How do we protect the assessment results? Pumba, I'll let you handle that one since you're in those. Yeah. All right. So that is that is another key tenet of the way we approach cybersecurity is instead of focusing on specific vulnerabilities, considering the fact that we only know what we know, we don't know the zero days that we haven't discovered yet. Instead of focusing on that, which typically is what we need to protect because that's what's going to be exploited, by focusing on the functionality of the system, what we're saying is this is the functionality that could, in a worst case scenario, lead to a fault. This is where you need to shore up your engineering. Typically, we don't consider that sensitive, classified at all. So it makes our job a lot easier in sharing that information. Because we're not going into the, into the specifics, we can keep it at a, at a lower level and be more open with that without revealing any specifics of how an adversary could actually hack into our system. Excellent. And we have a question here from Quentin Atkins. How are you going to standardize cybersecurity on the commercial international level? Oh, that's a, that's a great one. And uh, that's one of the benefits of using uh, the SDPA SEC approach because it's already in the international standards uh, for aircraft security uh, airworthiness or air, aircraft airworthiness security. So uh, it's already in the international standards. In, uh, incidentally, the way it got there uh, was by Embraer and I'd done some work with them and uh, they liked it so much that they did a pilot and tried it and uh, there's, uh, their results were outstanding and they said, it, this works so well, we're actually gonna get this in the international standards because again, until something is in the international standards, as good as it is, you, you're, you're using it at risk. And so they went ahead and championed that and now it's, uh, it is in the international standards. So it's approved to use. Great, and we have uh, an interesting question here. Um, would or should there be a standardized off switch where all flights are grounded in a situation during a national emergency involving aircraft? And who would have access to this off switch? Hmm. Uh, well, if it depends on how you define off switch because we have processes in place such as we saw after the 9-11 attack where uh, senior government officials can order the grounding, um, but that was um, not so much a physical off switch, I would call it a functional off switch or an organizational off switch where uh, the decision was made based upon uh, the environment and there were procedures in place uh, to pass that information out and there were compliance methods in place to make sure that people were complying with it. So I don't know if we want to go the direction of a single switch, but um, don't know. So I, I find this interesting because this is something that I've seen numerous times on different acquisition programs of having this functionality to completely control a system, especially if you look at like anti-tamper where we want to be able to, you know, melt the circuit boards at the end. Okay. Uh, one of the things we look at from a security perspective is, cool, you wanna have this functionality. What if that goes wrong? What if it happens when it shouldn't? Does that stop your mission? Does that lead you to a loss that you're not willing to live with? So it's a trade-off. There, there is no right answer, but the trade-off becomes, if we have this mythical off switch, what if a bad guy gets to it and grounds everything we do? Do we really need that functionality? Is the, the benefit worth the risk? And, and that's why being able to um, do the early functional work, such as what we're describing here, and the artifacts we produce really, really uh, 
provides the evidence and the uh, the artifacts or the data that's necessary. I call them grown folks conversations. Um, they, they really are. There is no right, there is no wrong, but you really have to sit down and you need to hear all the parties, all the, cause all the, all the folks have a stake and you need to hear those out and then you need to work together to come up with the best or synthesize the best solution that you can given the data that you got. That is a great place to end. Uh, I would like to give uh, a very big thank you both to uh, Colonel Young and Captain Oust uh, for this uh, great presentation today. Uh, for all of our participants, we are now heading back to the plener plenary space. So if you go back to the Agility Prime uh, site and go to the main plenary, uh, it will continue for there. And for the speakers, we release you. Thank you so much uh, for your presentations. Thanks, everyone. All righty. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.